Uh, welcome, everybody, to this uh, special event uh, brought to you by the Moraine Valley Library. This is part of our One Book, One College series. Uh, where this year we're looking at Eve Ewing's book of poetry um, called 1919, where um, Ewing takes us um, through the race riots that hit Chicago in 1919, but also challenges challenges us to think about the underlying um, issues of racism that connects in with economics and equity um, throughout our history, especially in the Chicagoland region. Um, with this program, we we take different themes from the book and have discussions. And so that's where we are today, where we are joined by our, our very special guest, um, Dr. Tracy Crump, who is the Associate Professor of Sociology, Anthropology, and Criminal Justice at St. Xavier University. Um, all of us at Rain Valley, we have great um, connections with, with um, Zabs. They're our friends right down the road. So I'm, I'm happy to have you here and build um, those connections um, even more strongly. Just a little bit about Dr. Crump. Um, she holds the PhD in crim criminology, law, and Justice from the University of Illinois at Chicago. She has a law degree from John Marshall Law School, and she has earned the LLM, which is a post-JD um, study uh, program at Loyola University uh, Chicago School of Law. So she brings with us, uh, brings brings to us a wealth of knowledge and expertise to help us have um, these conversations that are all, um, often very difficult um, to hold. So uh, it's it's this is challenging, but in the year 2021, after 2020, it feels like um, topics of equity and race are more vital than ever. So with that, um, I will turn it over to Dr. Crump. Um, just a comment, we, we um, our participants, um, you're not able to speak, everyone's muted, but um, you can please put questions in the Q&A and we will um, find time to pull those questions into our conversation. So again, thank you very much for your time and prep on this, Dr. Crump, and I'll turn it over uh, to you. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, so I, first of all, would like to thank Moraine Valley, um, as well as Troy Swanson and the team for allowing me this opportunity to talk to you all. So I'm, I am going to share my screen right now. Um, and as the file begins to share, uh, we're talking about having these inclusive conversations in inclusive spaces today. And so to have these conversations there, it's very nuanced. There are many things that we need to consider before we are able to fully engage in these conversations. So today's talk is just going to do um, a little bit of the work that, that we do as DEI professionals, as diversity, equity, and inclusion professionals, or as people who are on our own journeys with regard to um, gaining a level of cultural competence. And so with that, um, I am going to begin. Um, Troy did introduce me, so I'm not gonna take you through this, this slide again. I'm gonna jump right into kind of our agenda for today. So our agenda specifically is to understand what we need to have foundationally um, as we create these spaces to have these important conversations. And so to do so, we're going to take a look at Chicago, uh, Chicago's history, and specifically the um, situation that arose around the 1919 race riots and then bringing us to today, 2021. Uh, so you see on your screen the agenda, but you also see a graph. And this graph is, in essence, allowing us to see the nuance that's involved in having these conversations. You have diversity and inclusion. We all have different identities and different cultures, and thus we have different experiences. So we not only see the world in a way that others don't see the world, but we also are moving about this world with a sort of psychological contract, right? With a way that we understand the world and the way that we believe people understand us or perceive us. So with that being said, I want you to understand that um, there is a lot of nuance, uh, some things that, that I may say or that you may experience, right? We, we may be in alignment. We may be within t uh, in tune with one another. But then in other instances, we may have very different experiences, and that's okay, right? That's what makes us unique. That's what makes us the wonderful individuals that we are. 
So I'm first going to talk about Chicago residents by the numbers to give us a sense of how Chicago came to be and um, how some of the, the elements involved in a multicultural society uh, played a role in not only the tensions leading up to the race riots, but also how we responded afterwards. Then I'm going to talk about contributing factors of the tension and the actual race riots and a special commission that was formed after the race riots to look at uh, situations before, during, um, and then to make recommendations as to how to move forward. And then we're gonna take a look at today. Like, where are we? What do we need to have these spaces and conversations? And um, hopefully I'll be able to share a few tips on how we can get started. With that said, um, Eve Ewing's book. And so I have the book right here. I hope you all have your copy as well. Um, Eve Ewing's book, 1919, is a book of poetry. And on the back of the book, there is a wonderful quote that kind of allows us to understand what the, the, the book is about. And the quote has a specific line in it that captures a lot of what's going on in the poetry. Uh, specifically, the quote says, the Chicago race riot of 1919, uh, the most intense of the riots comprising the nation's red summer has shaped the last century, but is not widely discussed. And so a lot of people don't know about the race riots in Chicago. But for those of us who do, the book also goes deeper. The quote continues, Eve L. Ewing explores the story with reflections on race, class, violence, segregation, and the hidden histories that shape our divided urban landscape. And the reason I think this quote is so important is because it gives us some nuance. It allows us to understand that this is a multifaceted issue. It's also an issue that won't be solved overnight. And it's an issue that's important to us all because we share this space. We share this world. And for that reason, I wanted to open up with that quote. Now here is where you need to break out your pens, your pencils, your paper, your computer, um, because we're all here to learn about um, how do we begin this journey to create inclusive spaces and to have these, these important inclusive conversations. Well, I want you to, at the top of your paper, write where do we start? Just under that, write inclusive spaces and save a little room so you can create your own definition or you can utilize the definition that I will provide later. And then save enough space to have um, three takeaways for how we begin to have these conversations. So just to recap, at the top of the paper, where do we start? Just below that, inclusive spaces, and then save space for three takeaways from today's presentation. In DEI, we usually like to start not at, in the middle, right? Not when the initial incident occurred. We usually like to begin our conversations at the beginning, right? We want to find out how we came to the point where there was tension or there was an issue or a challenge. And so today's conversation about Chicago does just that. Um, for those of us who are in the great state of Illinois, um, in the Chicago land area, we, it's important that we acknowledge that we inhabit the land that was cultivated and cared for, um, for, for many years by at least 15 sovereign nations and tribes. And so on the screen, I do have kind of the, a graphic depiction of the landscape. I also have a um, list of some of the, the sovereign nations and tribes that began to kind of nurture the land so that we today can enjoy that. So I wanted to pay homage um, and also acknowledge that we understand that there were people who were here before us, people who, who allowed for us to enjoy what we enjoy now. Now, this isn't an all-inclusive list, um, and this le th this particular talk is not going to deal with a lot of the nuance, right? Those inclusive, important conversations, we'll save that for the next time. But at, to acknowledge right now that we understand this is kind of our first step. 
So Chicago's beginning was very meager. Um, in the 1770s, uh, we see John Baptiste Point du Sable coming to Chicago as a trader, um, meaning trading in goods such as furs um, along the shores of Lake Michigan. Um, John Baptiste Point du Sable is thought to be the first permanent non-indigenous resident of Chicago. Um, shortly after arriving in Chicago, he married uh, one of the indigenous women, Kitty Hawa, um, who uh, was uh, living on the land here with her family and they in turn had a family. So that was way back in 1770 where we see our first permanent non-indigenous resident. We also can trace Chicago's history back to pre-Chicago era when it was just Eshikagu, right? Meaning smelly onion, because, right, this was swampland at one point. Um, so, way back in 1829, we see the Illinois State Legislature hiring someone to plat lots of Chicago, right? So, to stake out different lots um, where they could then begin to create a more sustainable, a more structured um, place to reside. And so, they filed those plats in August of 18. 30. Now, at that time, there were only 100 residents, right? So those 100 people uh, decided that they wanted to uh, engage in, in uh, making sure this was their home. And so the, the, the plat was filed. And then in 1833, the town of Chicago was incorporated. But it, it, the, the population increased threefold at that time. So by the time the town of Chicago was incorporated, we see 350 people. And then just a mere four years later, they incorporated as a city. That city had a population of 4,000. So we see a growth in the number of people coming to the area. Here's an interesting fact. So a lot of us were, were um, thinking when we were younger or we were taught when we were younger that um, African Americans or Blacks didn't come to this geographical er area until the early 20th century. However, the very first neighborhood, Black neighborhood, um, was founded by a gentleman named John Jones and his wife, Mary Jane Richardson Jones, way back in 1845. So um, there we see the first kind of black community for working class individuals in our area. As we move forward, at the same time, we see an increased number of European immigration to the Chicagoland area. So from 1850 to 1870, we see an increase in population in general um, to 40,000 people, right? Then we see as we move forward, in uh, between 1860 and 1870, we see almost 300,000 people. So roughly 298,000 people who are coming to the Chicagoland area. Um, these individuals, specifically the ones from um, Europe, they were Irish. They also represented those who were from Germany or from Scandinavia, Italy, Hungary. Um, the uh, from Czechoslovakia, from Poland, and then also Eastern European Jews arrived. And they came for many reasons, right? Some of them came escaping famine. Some of them came escaping torture. Uh, some of them came for prosperity and, and to look for a better future. Um, and we can hear kind of notions of that from immigrants today who say this is why they come to the United States. So one of the largest increases of residents in the Chicago land area came between 1870 and 1900. There we see an increase from 299,000 to 1.7 million residents in our geographical location. In a parallel move, we also see increases in, in the black population in the, the area. So in 1860, roughly 1,000 residents identified as black or African-American. Um, when we look at the census again in 1890, we see there are 15,000 blacks or African-Americans represented. Um, and 
uh, close to this time in the early 1900s, we also see something else happening. So in the Southern states, we, we have a situation that was untenable for many blacks in the South. Uh, they were persecuted, they were victimized, they were discriminated against, they were tortured. And so um, before the, the Civil War and during the Civil War, also after the Civil War, we see uh, Blacks trying to flee the South. Well, in great numbers, Blacks fled the South between 1915 and 1970. But specifically, during the time frame that we're concerned about, we see about 500,000 people making Chicago their home, fleeing tyranny and oppression in the South, thus increasing the number of the Black population in the Chicagoland area. Now, I wanted to kind of look at the, the map of Chicago, specifically by race, during the time that we're considering. So in 1910, what we see on the left side of your screen is a map that indicates that majority of the residents in the Chicagoland area, they're white, right? Um, but if we look 10 years down the line at the map on your right, what we start to see is an increase in the black population. So there are three areas where the black population is over 60%. And this is the first time that it has been recorded that such a large number of blacks are in this particular area. Um, the reason I wanted to point you to that uh, map is because you'll notice that we saw blacks were congregating in one specific area, right? And you're like, hey, wait a minute. If they made the trek from the South all the way to Chicago, why are they all settling in the same area? Well, there are a couple things going on. Um, and I'll talk about those in a second. But um, I wanted to, before I do that, I wanted to talk a little bit about land use in Chicago. And so one of our prominent sociologists, um, Professor Burgess, came up with a model to kind of describe what was going on when it comes to how people use land and how land is predetermined um, for its use purposes. And uh, Professor Burgess came up with the concentric zone model. And in a nutshell, uh, this model says that there are certain areas of the, the city that are being used for specific reasons. And what we see here is six different zones that he came up with. Um, the first zone would be like our uh, downtown area. The second zone would have been uh, the factory area during during that time in, in 1920s. The third zone was a zone of transition. And so this zone either was being converted from one use to the other use, or um, that zone was was um, made for, for living, for, for residential inhabitant. Um, but unfortunately, in this third zone, there was low cost housing. And in many cases, that, that housing didn't have um, a high quality of life, right? So it didn't have a lot of grocery stores with healthy foods, um, um, health care organizations that were able to provide health care services that um, people needed. It probably did not have a lot of the services um, as far as sanitation services. So um, that situation was, was present in that third zone. In the fourth zone, these were individuals who were able to move out of the third zone, right? These were individuals who had some sort of advantage Advantage. They were um, close to in, in places of employment, but they were also far enough that they could have access to all of those, those resources I mentioned earlier. The fifth zone were people who uh, were, were more affluent. They were able to afford more expensive residential homes. And so they, they resided there. We considered that the outer suburbs or the suburbs. And then the sixth zone were the commuter zones. These people were highly affluent um, and they had the means and the resources to travel to zone one or the downtown area um, if they so desired to. But they were also far enough removed from the um, lower income, the um, less advantaged areas um, that they didn't see the challenges that people in those areas faced. 
Now, I brought up a few minutes ago this notion of why did right black people come all the way from the southern states to Chicago to congregate in one small area where well, there were a couple things going on. Um, and w the graphic map of Chicago that you see on your screen, you'll see it's kind of color coded. It has um, red, it has yellow, it has blue and a little bit of green. Well, this map was used by individuals who are making decisions to either loan to people for mortgages, for example, or rent to people um, as far as renting an apartment or renting a house. Um, and this map, this situation that we see on the map is called redlining. Um, it's a situation where individuals who, who had the power to determine where people could and could not live, well, they just marked on the map where they could and could not live. Um, if they put green there, this was thought to be one of the best areas. And if it was blue, it was a desirable area. Consequently, these areas were where white people lived. Um, if there was a yellow area, it was considered to be a, a neighborhood in transition, right? Either being um, transferred from one use to the other or minorities were moving in that neighborhood. And then if it was deemed red, it was considered hazardous. In these particular areas, they were um, pr primarily occupied by minority citizens. And what was unfortunate is uh, in many cases, minority citizens or minoritized citizens were unable to move from those locations. So whereas people who lived in the green area or the blue area, um, pretty much white people during that day and time, um, they could move wherever they wanted to. Uh, but those who lived in the red areas, they couldn't move. And so that's why you see this tight concentration of red in um, what we see as the south um, southeast side of, of this the city of Chicago. Uh, these uh, areas also suffered from having inadequate access to, to resources to um, better their quality of life. Um, in addition to redlining, they had contract selling where contracts were only able to be sold to certain people um, and those contracts had like stipulations in them. So on the left side of your screen, you see a deed from um, uh, that era, in the 1920s. And this deed specifically says that this property is not to be sold to black people. Right. So even during that time, if someone was to uh, be a black person in the city of Chicago there and they were able to get enough money to purchase a home, the deed which stays with the home, stays with the property, stays with the land, the deed indicated that 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 family or that person, um, if they were black, they couldn't live there. So we have redlining, we have the, these um, deeds with, with these restrictive covenants in them, we have contract selling, we also had blockbusting where individuals um, would, who, who were either real estate brokers or in the real estate market, um, they would go block by block, right? And if they deem that block to be in transition, they would tell the residents there, hey, um, there are going to be minorities moving in this neighborhood. Um, your property value will go down. And what they would do is they would get them to sell their property, um, in many cases, lower than market value. And then they would in turn sell the property or resell the property to a black family at higher rates. So this made the cost of living increase in those areas as well. Um, in addition to having a, a higher uh, price tag on the home, uh, the insurance was higher. The um, resources to keep the home running was higher. So there was an increased cost of living and increased a situation where money was going out for those who were willing to uh, conduct business in that those areas. So right, they also had to pay higher, for example, insurance rates to do business in those areas. So we see this kind of concentrating of black people in one, in certain areas, concentrating of white people during that time in certain areas. Um, we also can kind of 
make an inference that there was little room for any kind of intercultural dialogue, right? Because if if black people are located in one area and white people are located in another area and there's very little opportunity for them to, to share an experience, you could see how that could create a space where there isn't a lot of information for clarity with regard to gaining cultural competence. So because we were in that space, racial tension started to increase. We have an increase in the number of European immigrants coming to the country. We have an increase in the number of blacks coming from the South to the Chicagoland area, right? Jobs were here. However, um, there were labor shortages. There were labor shortages because of uh, the vast amount of, of uh, working people or working class people who were eligible to work in this area. In addition, uh, the U.S. government halted immigration from Europe. So now we're left with people who are competing for jobs in some cases. Um, in other cases, we have people who are together in these spaces who don't know a lot about each other as far as culturally, um, and they weren't speaking a lot about these, these differences and getting clarity. And so we have racial conflict. Uh, specifically, what was noted in one report, and I'll talk about that a little later, was that white workers resented the presence of Blacks um, in this geographical location because they felt they had to compete with them for the jobs that were available. So as you could imagine, with the sheer number of people who began to inhabit this area and the labor shortages and the racial conflict, there came a time when there was a serious issue. And that time was July 27th, 1919. On that day, uh, it was sweltering hot. And so, right, people in Chicago do what people in Chicago do. They go to the lake to cool down. Um, there were thousands of Chicagoans at the lakefront, uh, specifically at, at the beach um, near 29th Street. And among these people were um, Eugene Williams and his friends. And what they uh, decided to do, do was to go for a swim, get on a raft, and enjoy their day. Now, Eugene was just 17 years old. Um, he and his friends were on a raft. And so the raft was right doing what a raft does. It, it goes with the waves. It goes with the flow. And the raft inadvertently drifted over an imaginary line that divided the lake by race. Right. Hold on to that. There's an imaginary line in the lake at 29th Street that no one can see but people think exists that divided the lake into one section for blacks, one section for whites. And so what we see when that raft goes over that imaginary line is we see a young man, George Stauber, he begins to hurl stones at the raft. Right. Uh, I should mention that George Stauber was a 24 year old white man. He begins to hurl these stones at the raft and Eugene fell off the raft. Eugene ultimately could not make it back to the raft or could not make it back to shore. And he unfortunately died. He drowned. Um, now, right. I said thousands of people were on the beach that day. So, right, we have thousands of people who potentially were witnesses. And what we see then is the police being called. And when the police officer first arrived on the scene, the police officer's name was Daniel uh, Callahan. When Callahan arrived on the scene, he refused to take Stauber into custody. Now, imagine that. You have a beach with thousands of people who were potential witnesses, who saw what happened, who requested that they get help, who identified the person who allegedly caused the injury that caused the drowning, and the police officer refused to take that person into custody. As you would imagine, there were people who were upset and um, those who were, who were angry. And what followed next was eight days of, of rioting, 
um, from July 27th, the day that Eugene drowned, until August 3rd, there were arsons and gunfights and knife fights and fist fights um, that lasted throughout the Chicagoland area. Um, over this period of time, after everything was over, 38 people lost their lives and over 500 people were injured. Of those who, who passed away, 23 were black and 15 were white. Now, people were speculating as to, to what happened, what was going on, and you know, what happens when, when things occur, people, right, add their two cents in here or there, they may share their true experiences, but right, we, they didn't, um, all of them didn't have a full understanding of what happened. But what was identified was a lot of the violence that was perpetrated against black residents, it, it, it came at the hands of what they termed white athletic clubs. Um, and so there was this call for having a more formal investigation to find out not only what happened on that day, but what happened before leading up to the environment, the atmosphere where something like that could happen. So what uh, ultimately happened was the Illinois governor, Frank Loudon, uh, decided to impanel a nonpartisan interracial investigative committee. And this committee uh, was the Chicago Commission on Race Relations. They were charged with investigating the causes of the riot and with making recommendations on how they could move forward. So the commission came up with 59 recommendations. I am not going through 59 recommendations. Um, if you'd like, I will tell you how you get a copy of it. But I did pull out 12 that were paramount to our discussion today. And so they um, decided to uh, release these recommendations after having going through an exhaustive study of the, the situation, the environment, talking to witnesses. Um, and those witnesses weren't just individuals. Those witnesses were also entities, right? Like the church, the school, um, those important entities that uh, are involved with the way that we see the world and the way that the world sees us. And so of these recommendations, the committee said, hey, we want people charged who were breaking laws, right? We want them to be arrested. We want them to be charged and we want them to be prosecuted. Executed. They also wanted the, the police, the state's attorney and the courts to suppress the bombings, right? Stop the bombings. If you um, uh, if people are brought to you who have allegedly committed a, a crime, then those individuals need to be dealt with specifically with regard to the bombing of, of units, of dwellings, of businesses. They also wanted the police to pay more attention to the athletic clubs. Now, when I hear athletic clubs, I think, right, baseball, basketball, football. Um, these weren't those kind of athletic clubs. Um, if we were to, to term what they are now, um, so most people would term them as gangs. And so the commission wanted the police to pay more attention to these athletic clubs because through their research, those athletic clubs were found to be uh, a fruitful source of racial conflict is how they put it. They wanted um, more gun control, right? To, to control the possession, the sale, and the importation of firearms. They also wanted uh, to, to have buildings condemned that were deemed unfit for human habitation. And then they got to the schools. They wanted more schools in the black communities because at that time there were very few schools in those communities and even fewer schools that were providing sufficient educational resources to, to at least give a strong foundation to black youth so that they could be productive citizens. In addition to just schools, they wanted to appoint principals and teachers who had a certain level of cultural competence, or as they put it, a sympathetic and intelligent interest in promoting good race relations, right? So they were looking at people who pour into children, pour information into children and help shape their identity and how they see the world. And they wanted to appoint people who, who would be positive um, and positively impact those youth. They also wanted to involve 
all stakeholders. They wanted to involve schools and social centers, um, churches and labor unions, other organizations and agencies to help them to dispel false notions that had been disseminated for years and decades earlier about races, about people of different races. Um, in addition, they wanted to end segregation by race, right? They specifically said they wanted to cease the practice of redlining and contract selling and blockbusting and steering and speculation, right? All of those things I talked about earlier as contributing to the tensions, the commission saw it in 1922 as being paramount to the increased tension and they wanted it to cease. But they didn't stop there. They also wanted to cease denying the hiring and promotion of people based on race. They wanted to cease um, having access denied to people based on race in restaurants and in theaters and stores and other places of public accommodation. And then finally, they charged the media, right? They had a recommendation for the media and they said, hey, media, Please apply standards of accuracy and decency and fairness and a sense of proportion when you're publishing the news. Now, if I were a gambling woman, which I am not, but I would think some of you are saying, hey, wait a minute, this list, although it says commission's 1922 recommendations, this list seems like something that we might see today. And that makes us wonder, what happened with the committee's recommendations? Was anything done? Why are we here today having this conversation about inclusive spaces? Well, I'll tell you what happened. What we see here is, and watch the screen, we see an increase in um, blacks coming to the Chicago land area. We see an increase in Latino and Hispanic and Mexican residents coming to the area. And then by 1990, we also see an increase of people who identified or were identified by researchers as Asians coming to the area. We see increased diversity. Even with the recommendations from the commission, and some faithful groups, right, taking those recommendations on and there was legislation enacted and there were, right, cultural norms in areas that said, hey, let's do this. Um, things did get better, but things didn't get perfect. And we're not saying that things will get perfect, but right, we're taking incremental steps. This this idea of having inclusive spaces, this is a, a, a relay. It's a marathon. Um, think back to our parents and the journeys they had. Their journeys were not the same as our journeys, and our journeys aren't going to be the same as the people who come behind us. But here today, our step is to begin to think about these inclusive spaces. So remember that homework sheet I gave you all? Right, let's start filling that in. So where do we start? We start by having um, similar terminology and understanding where we are and what we desire. The, the first thing we're here for is to understand how we have these inclusive spaces. And so what, what are inclusive spaces? Well, um, in a nutshell, they can be said to be spaces where two or more people from different cultural backgrounds can come and engage in dialogue to achieve equitable outcomes. Now, right, what do I mean by equity? Let's get that out there. When I say equity, I simply mean having resources that are available to people who need them based on their needs, right? So my needs are different than your needs. And so the resources that I need will be different than the resources that you, you need. Now, we may share some similar re needs and resources. But right, specifically when we're talking about equity, we're talking about those resources that the individual, the agency, the entity, or the organization needs based on what they say they need. So these inclusive spaces are designed to allow us to begin to come together and dialogue about what we need, about what our experiences are. Now, the first step to, to having uh, an inclusive space 
Um, and having an inclusive conversation is self-assessment. It starts with you. Um, I always tell people, look in the mirror, right? Um, oftentimes it's easy for us to say, oh, I'm so angry at that person. Let me tell you what they did. Um, but if we are really truly going to engage in these conversations, then we need to start with ourselves. We need to consistently learn about ourselves and understand our own values and beliefs and assumptions and biases, right? There are a lot of things, a lot of elements that inform the way we see the world, uh, specifically uh, our schooling, our family, um, our culture, any kind of personal interactions that we may have had, um, those all are pouring into us and they help us to, to make a decision as to how we want to interact with the world. It helps us to make a decision as to how we believe the world sees us. Um, it helps us to, 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 to understand how we think we need to show up um, every day in spaces that we show up in. And so our first step is self-assessment. Our first step is to think about who we are and what we like and what we don't like and what our values are and our beliefs, um, ideologies and philosophies. What are those? Um, and also think about how they came to be. Uh, for example, so I have this thing about being outside at nighttime just don't like it. I was told a long time ago that there are bad people outside at nighttime and I didn't want to be associated with bad people outside at nighttime. And so I don't like to be out when it's dark. Um, however, I have grown to learn that not all people who are outside at night are bad, right? Some people work outside at night. So, right, that's my own personal bias. And recognizing my biases allow me then to manage those biases. So when I see someone out at nighttime and I, I hear that little voice in my head saying, mm -mm, that person is up to no good, right? I then can manage that and say, well, wait a minute, Tracy, right? That person could be going to work or could be going to school. That person doesn't have the same experience as you you do. That person doesn't have the same um, cultural understanding as you do. And so therefore, Tracy Crump, you cannot judge that person for being outside at night. Now, I don't say this stuff out loud, so don't worry about me. But right when we think about our own likes and beliefs and dislikes, that's kind of that first step. So doing that self-assessment. The second step is education. And right, that's why I began the presentation the way I began the presentation. Um, education is, is important because if you come to inclusive spaces, right, you have to be able to talk with some level of, of cultural competence, right? You have to have some level of, of cultural maturity to engage in these conversations. These conversations are hard sometimes. These conversations require a lot of people to um, dredge up historical traumas that they may have experienced or that their loved ones have experienced or that their community has experienced. And because of this, we need to, to be able to engage in these conversations with some level of competence. And to gain that competence, we need to do the research. Um, specifically, what I say is ongoing research. So once you're on this journey, this journey doesn't stop. This re journey requires us to engage in research on our own, engage in research in groups. I specifically like going directly to the source. Um, so I seek primary sources, but I seek multiple primary sources. So if I want to know about the black community, I will go to um, a place such as the NAACP or the DuSable Museum of African American History. Or if I ha have someone or know someone who is willing able and comfortable with sharing with me their experience, then I would go to that person. Um, the key here though, is with individuals, right? Ask, don't just bombard someone and say, hey, let, let's just talk about your life. Start when you were born, right? Some people aren't, aren't ready for that. Like you, you have to kind of build up the emotional reserves to kind of have these conversations, but have the conversations nonetheless, Make sure those conversations are educated conversations, meaning you have done the work. 
And then the third, I think, key element to beginning to, to create inclusive spaces is commitment. Um, this is long term work. This is not something that that will be done after one session. In fact, um, this is ongoing work. I've been engaged in this kind of uh, self discovery and um, outward expression of understanding and, and sharing in inclusive spaces since 1993. And I'm still learning and I'm still sharing. So there is a commitment. Um, I always say this is heart work, right? It's, it's hard work, but it's also heart work. We essentially are reshaping and changing the way that we see the world. We're adding value to our lives. We're, we're transforming the way that we see things and understanding the world in a different way. And because of this, um, we need to recognize that these situations did not occur overnight. And because they did not occur overnight, right, the problem won't be solved overnight. Um, so if we are going to, to begin to have these inclusive spaces and to begin to create these inclusive spaces, then we do need to engage in self-assessment, right? Looking at ourselves, we need to educate ourselves, um, have a level of cultural competency about ourselves and other cultures. And we need to have the commitment to sustain, right? This is, is, is something that we're going to be doing in the, the long run, right? This isn't something that's going to end right away. So those three elements are foundational um, for us to begin to have these inclusive conversations. Dr. Crump, if I can just jump in for a second, I want to just um, acknowledge a comment in the Q and A um, from uh, Suleiman Nasser noted um, the the parallels between um, the death of Eugene Williams in 1919. Um, and the murder of George Floyd um, this last year. I, I just didn't want to let that go um, uncommented on. And I know you're going in that direction, but I don't know if you wanted to offer any thoughts briefly um, on those parallels. Yeah, no, I am actually here, so that is perfect. So when we look at 1919 and the situation leading up to 1919, we do see parallels with 2021. Specifically, in 1919, there were um, reports of, of fights, of, of, of racial conflict and uh, of um, racial unrest on smaller scales before the riot, such as there were um, issues in 2010, 2020, 2021, right? We, we have those, those issues. Um, so there are parallels. What I also saw was, right, once there was this issue, there was unrest, there were there was rioting in the case of, of, of 1919, but then there's this point where there's an opportunity for understanding and reconciliation. And so, yes, those parallels in 1919 are here in 2020 and 2021 with the murder of George Floyd. But I don't even want to, to, to kind of begin with George Floyd. Remember kind of my, um, my, my formula for understanding these conversations, right? If we're going to talk about it, let's talk about it. Let's start with Eugene. Let's, let's, let's start with Emmett Till. Right. Let, let, let's start with Trayvon Martin. Let's start with Michael Brown. Right. So. So, yes, I do see the parallels, um, but it feels different. I don't know if it feels different from you all for you all, but it feels different for me um, as, as being someone who was not born during the civil rights movement. When people put their feet to the pavement, um, someone who acknowledges that all of their hard work led to me being able to not have to think about those things in my early years. Um, what, what I do see is it's just a different feeling with, with this year's um, kind of understanding of what's going on. Uh, because we not only have um, black folks, and I, I use the X um, and so instead of the LKS, when I say folks to acknowledge the people who were unnamed, who have come before us. But um, this year, people were marching with black folks, right? People from other communities. I saw a, um, a, a, a multi 
um, a multi-layered community of activists, young and old, rich and poor, um, those from varying cultural and ethnic and racial backgrounds, varying uh, genders and non-conforming genders, right? I saw a, a rainbow coalition, if you will, of people who were advocating on behalf of the community. And so that's why it felt different to me. And I think this is a wonderful opportunity for us all to right, take a beat and think about how we can make a difference, whether it is a difference for ourselves or a difference in, in our families, in our communities, in our places of employment or places of worship. I think all of those parallels that we see that bring us to where we are today, we need to consider that. And we need to consider who we are, who we would like to be and where we would like to go. Okay, so a few considerations for inclusive spaces. Um, when we think about these inclusive spaces, we have to remember that we need to develop a, co a common goal for these conversations. Have you ever been in a situation where you're talking to someone and you're trying to get your point across and they're trying to get your their point across and right, you kind of recognize that no one is getting their point across? When you have these inclusive conversations in these spaces, there needs to be a common goal, right? A common goal for the conversation. Now that that goal can be a short-term goal, a mid-range goal or long-term goal, but there needs to be a common goal so that people in the conversation can stay focused. We also need to require respect and truthfulness, right? So that's non-negotiable. Um, respect and truthfulness is, is reciprocal. So all parties involved in that conversation need to make sure that they are, are going to abide by kind of that, that requirement. And then we can't just focus on individuals, right? We also need to include discussions about systems and the implications of those systems. So if we go back to 1919, right, we saw individual people who were discriminating, right? Um, but we also saw structures and systems in the form of redlining and blockbusting and, right, Right? not lending um, money to people who are buying, trying to buy homes or property based on race, right? That's something larger than an individual. So we need to consider that. And then acknowledge the challenges with contributing to courageous spaces. So these spaces, right, as I mentioned before, these spaces are hard sometimes. Um, and so there's going to be challenges. There's going to be times when we don't agree and that's okay, right? Remember those unique experiences and what makes us all wonderful. Um, so acknowledge that challenge, recognize when it's there and say that it's there, but right, keep that common goal in mind. And then finally, equalize power dynamics um, and elevate personal narratives. So oftentimes when we're having conversations, one person may have more power in the room, whether it is adults with their children or, um, or teachers with their students or clergy people with right their congregants or uh, people who are employees with their supervisors or managers, we need to make sure that we, we, we acknowledge those power dynamics and we equalize them. And one way we can do, one thing we can do to equalize those conversations and that power is to elevate the personal narrative. Remember, we are the experts on our own experiences. And because we are the experts, right, there's no one who's walked in your shoes. There's no one who can tell you how it feels to be you. So, right, own that. And when you're educated about yourself and you've kind of done that kind of critique on yourself and understand who you are and what you stand for and what you will not stand for, it's a lot easier a lift to talk to people about your personal narrative. So those are our key considerations for inclusive spaces. And then I want us to, to, to kind of uh, also acknowledge that building and maintaining relationships, right? When you think about the relationships that you have in your personal and professional lives, you don't just automatically have a relationship. That relationship is built and it requires a certain level of care to maintain it. Um, building and maintaining relationships is important and fostering trust and empathy, right? 
uh, an ability to, to listen to someone's story and to empathize with them is really important. And then finally, preserving a sense of inclusion and belonging, right? Just to include someone in something is very different than that person feeling they belong, right? I can let you in my house, but then I can not feed you and I can cut the lights out on you, right? And I can throw water on you. That's not a sense of belonging. So, right, inclusion also requires people to to, to create an environment for belonging, right? Um and, and then I guess finally, what I would also like to leave us with is remember what you say and how you say it matters. Uh, I am a firm believer in thinking uh, deeply before I say something because I want to leave every interaction that I have with my head and heart intact, but I want the people who have interactions with me to leave with their heads and their hearts intact as well. So remember what you say and how you say it. It truly matters. And of course, right, I got to show my little references <laughs> because, right, we, we, we do not um, come to where we are on our own. Um, and so I want to acknowledge all of the people who came before me um, to help me to understand uh, where we are and how we got here and to help me kind of decide where I want to fit into this world um, that, that we call our home. All right, so do we have any, that's all I have to say, do we have any questions? There's a few in the, yes, there's a few in the q and A. Um, a comment from Albino Gonzalez noted, um, uh, Self-assessment is extremely important um, when trying to create change, which I think is a good comment for sure. There's a question from um, Diego. I would like to ask about the relationship considerations and the conflict um, in uh, between race and class, specifically at the beginning of the 20th century and, of course, even today. Okay. Um, so uh, is there a specific question or... So is there a specific question or do we just want to talk about kind of the conflict? You know, I guess a thing that this question really sparks for me is, you know, maybe just a little more um, discussion. You know, we haven't, it seems, you know, there's the quote um, in the 1919 book that specifically lives for African Americans in Chicago are radically different and radically unchanged, which I think is a powerful um, idea. And maybe just to think about like, you know, why, like what are the, the forces that still um, have, have been at work that has made it unchanged, which of course you've touched on, but maybe to yeah. flush a little bit of that out a little bit. Yeah, so, so when we think about uh, Chicago, unfortunately Chicago is still one of the most segregated um, cities in, in the union right in this geographical location and because of that um moving from 1919 to right the 60s and 70s and 80s what we see is over time um we see a lot of disinvestments in certain communities and what i mean by that is a lot of resources that provide quality of care and quality of life services um many of those services are unavailable or people have to travel far to get to those services. So we often hear about food deserts, right? Um, areas in the city of Chicago, specifically in the south and west side, that don't have uh, grocery stores with fresh fruits and vegetables and um, other resources that people would need to sustain themselves, to be healthy, so that they could don't have to go to a hospital. Um, but if they do have to go to the hospital, the hospital in their area doesn't have um, sufficient services to, to care for them. So they are less likely to be diagnosed with certain diseases earlier um, in time for them to be treated. So when they are diagnosed, um, they're diagnosed later when right there are only certain options available to them. In addition to that, we also have over-policed communities. Um, and in many cases, these communities are minoritized communities. And I, I, I want to pause here. I often say minoritized 
Um, I know in the literature they use minority. Uh, I say minoritized because this was a situation that was inflicted on people, right? Race is a social construct. And um, the more we continue to buy into that social construct, construct um, the more power that it has. So I often say minoritized. Um, but in minoritized communities, we see a disproportionate representation of law enforcement officers there. Um, and what that means is the more police officers who are in certain areas, the, the more likely they are going to, to find infractions. Um, and this may introduce uh, people into the, the juvenile justice system or the criminal justice system. Um, we also have in these particular communities, these uh, zero tolerance policies in our schools. And uh, the reason I bring this up is because this also has implications for the, the juvenile justice system and the criminal justice system, right? If, if a child has so many demerits and that demerits it turns into a suspension and they have so many suspensions then that suspension turns into an expulsion and they have so many suspensions and expulsions on their records and then right they're picked up for the police by the police for being truant right and now that, that during the truancy hearing the school record comes out and they had all of these infractions and all of these demerits and all of these suspensions and they were expelled and this is a bad child and now I'm going to send this child to the juvenile justice system. And when that child gets out of the juvenile justice system, right? And if there's another infraction, well, now they have a juvenile justice system record. And so now, right, let's send them to the criminal justice system. So that stems from the, this notion of, of resources and access in minoritized communities. Um, we can look, we can talk all day. We can look at healthcare. We can look at education. We can look at the criminal justice system. We can also, um, in general, look at, at faith-based organizations, social systems, and what's available to people and not available to people in these communities. Um, we still see those parallels today. So whether we're talking about 1919, 1960, or 2021, we still see those parallels. Um, and it's going to take all of us to, to write, call out the parallels, to, to challenge our legislators um, to, to do what we want them to do. Um, it's going to take us, in some cases, some of us put our bodies on the line, some of us put our minds on the lines, some of us know how to work a phone really well, right? Or send an email, but uh, we, we need to kind of recognize what it is that we can do, what we can handle, and take ownership and do it. One question, and maybe this is more of a positive push. Um, you had used the term Rainbow Coalition to talk about the people that were out working, which I think is great. Um, and, you know, I think especially in the last um, month or so with the in, the insurrection at the Capitol, we've really been down on um, social media in such a negative way, which, of course, there's many negative aspects of social media. Um, but... Um, a comment, uh, again, from Albino Gonzalez about uh, the, the power of social media to reach across communities. And I don't know if you had comments on that, but I think that's a really um, nice positive note uh, with social media for sure. Yeah, I, I actually do. So um, I know a lot of people are down on the media in general. Um, but with social media, what we have to do, and remember I said self-reflection, right? We are social media. What social media has allowed us to do is to not only be consumers of information, but also producers of information. So, right, I can tweet something out right now and it can go halfway around the world in seconds. Um, what I did see with regard to the events that happened over the summer and um, subsequently after was I saw people harnessing the power of social media in a positive way, right? Um, in some cases, people were sharing a positive thought, uh, specifically dealing with, with the situation we are dealing with now, uh, COVID. Uh, people are sending love through social media and while we should be able to see the, the, the positive aspects, we also need to recognize the power that it gives us. Um, we need to remember what we say once it gets into the world, it's, it's, it's out into the world. So we need to, to, to acknowledge that. Now, 
Um, with regard to social media, also, it's a way for us to get information from people we otherwise would not get information from, um, which is helpful to people who want to create inclusive spaces. So, right, if I'm in Chicago and someone else is in Miami and we want to have that that culturally competent, inclusive conversation, right, we can get on Cisco WebEx or Zoom or Skype, I don't know if I'm old, but right, is that a thing still? So we can still connect using social media. So yeah, I I, I definitely am a proponent of social media, um, but I also say use it wisely um, and think about what you're going to put out before you put it out. And also vet your sources, right? I have an issue with people not vetting those sources. They just get in and they retweet it and they send it out and without vet those sources. Call your librarian. They can help. <laughs> um, and I, I, I know we're almost out of time, um, but I do think this comment from Jose that just came in is really important in the discussions around equity and inclusion because I hear this all the time. You know, I'm not racist. I don't know. You know, what, what can we do? We're not. People aren't racist, are they? But the difference between systems that have racist outcomes that we participate in and support versus how we typically think about racism, I think is an important distinction. And maybe you could help shed a little light um, on that distinction. Yeah, you, you know, when I when I hear that, um, I, I always acknowledge, right, uh, that, that that is a feeling that the person or the, the uh, individual has. But I, when I think of racism, I think of power, right? A person can be prejudiced, which is totally different than, um, a, a person being racist, right? A person can have insufficient information and, and develop stereotypes and and um, not like someone because of their race or ethnicity, right? That's personal prejudice. But when we think about racism and systemic racism, we're thinking about power, right? The power to take away some right that belongs to someone. And one way I can explain this is this. Let's say I take my um, my bias, right, my prejudice against people who are outside at nighttime and I am in the courtroom and the judge says, Crump, you're up. Usually what that means is that there is a person in the courtroom who is unrepresented and that person needs an attorney. Right. And I look across the room and I notice that the person who needs the attorney is someone who I saw who was outside at night. Now, I've already in my mind allowed my bias and my prejudice to say that person is guilty. They are outside at night. They're a bad person. Right. But just saying that, just having that in my mind. Right. That doesn't disenfranchise the person. If I then go to represent that person as an attorney, I now have the power to inflict discrimination, to not allow this person to have all of their rights, to right, uh, uh, veer my racism at that time towards having some negative outcome in that person's life. So I, I, I usually what I try to do is I try to distinguish between uh, individual prejudice and having the power to allow that individual prejudice to be inflicted as racism against someone else. And then also systemic racism, right? We, we don't exist in a vacuum. So what are the laws that are able to wield this power to disenfranchise people? Um, what are the entities that have the power to disenfranchise or discriminate against people? So that's how I kind of try to, to balance that um, on a surface level. Okay, and there's a comment I didn't want to overlook from um, Suleiman, um, who mentioned um, Islamophobia, especially after 9-11, uh, which I know in our library over um, the decades, we've had many discussions along those lines, and I know it's a topic that comes up, um, and it's um, definitely something that is a type of racism that um, really has still a lot of power, um, and definitely things we'll be talking about down the road. And I don't know if you wanted to comment um specifically on that? Yeah, I, I can. So when we, when we think about Islamophobia, when we think about um, anti-Jewish or anti-Semitic um, instances, when we think about we have a rise right now in 
in hate crimes against people who identify as um, being Asian or who are identified as being Asian, right? We think about all of these minoritized groups and time after time after time, we see that racism in, in a sense, the power to disenfranchise people uh, is, is being wielded at people. And right, Islamophobia is, is no different. Uh, identifying or signaling, singling out any group uh, based on ethnicity or race um, needs to be addressed. It needs to be dealt with and having a space, an inclusive space to talk about, to strategize, right? In some cases to just right, vent uh, is really important. Thank you so much. That's probably a great place to end. Can I just say on behalf of Moraine Valley and um, our students and faculty, thank you so much for your time. This was a great um, conversation that really, I think, brought you know a lot of pieces together with um, the early history through 1919 and then where we can go. So I, I greatly appreciate it. And I want to give a special shout out. Thank you to Kathleen McInerney from St. Xavs, who was actually a former uh, teacher of mine who put me in touch with Dr. Crump. So um, thank you, Kathleen, for doing that. And um, I look forward um, to welcoming you um, to campus someday, I hope, Dr. Crump, not just online. So um, thank you so much. Thank you to our students and participants um, who are able to be here. So all the thank yous are coming through in the Q&A. Thank you, everybody. All thank right. you so much. And I want to say thank you to Troy for having me. Thank you to Moraine Valley, to the administration and the faculty and staff and students there. And I do look forward to seeing you all in person. Um, post COVID. <laughs> and thank you everyone for, for coming um, and listening to the talk. It's been great. You got it. You got it. We have such good connections between Zavs and Moraine, so we should keep these conversations going. So definitely. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all.